Good morning, and welcome to another installment of the Texas Journal Land Office Clean Coast Texas Lunch and Learn series, where we connect with coastal water resources and learn about ways to understand and enhance the management of stormwater runoff. My name is Jason Pinchback, the Water Resources Manager at the Texas General Land Office, working under the leadership of Commissioner Don Buckingham. This event is sponsored by the Texas Coastal Management Program and is intended to be an easy to access forum, removing impediments associated with attending conferences or long meetings, where we invite subject matter experts to unpack their initiatives into bite-sized morsels, to share ideas that might be useful for neighboring coastal communities to improve local water quality and habitat. Future Lunch and Learn events coming up this spring and summer will feature a deep dive into Texas Beach Watch with their very own Lucy Flores in about two weeks on April 25th, mark your calendars. We'll also look into economics and water quality with PhD candidate Virgie Greb, and we'll explore insights into which species are driving bacteria loading with Dr. Terry Gently from Texas A&M College Station. Clean Coast Texas is here to serve communities by providing local governments, decision makers, and the public with information, resources, and tools to better manage stormwater quality and its associated runoff. The tools and guidance provided through Clean Coast Texas can help coastal communities implement measures to reduce the impact of land use change on coastal waters and protect natural resources that support a thriving Gulf Coast economy. Some examples of Clean Coast services include community planning and ordinance development, water quality analysis and green infrastructure workshops, grant development and related project management, stormwater retrofits, and green infrastructure demonstration projects. To assist the General Land Office with this initiative and knowing this type of challenge takes a team of well-seasoned and knowledgeable practitioners, the GLO formed a collaborative with Meadow Center for Water and the Environment at Texas State University, Texas Community Watershed Partners at AgriLife Extension Service, and Texas Sea Grant at Texas A&M. I'd also like to take a moment to thank Sarah Wingfield and Christina Lopez of Meadow Center for Water and the Environment for co-hosting and providing technical support for the Lunch and Learn events and for all the other work that happens behind the scenes. Today's featured presentation is provided by Dr. Gabrielli Bonatti. He is an, ag, uh, an extension program specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension and has developed and implemented educational programs for water districts and homeowners. He currently supports the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality's Coastal Zone Act Reauthorization Amendment projects and the Texas General Land Office's coastal management projects to identify historical and potential drivers of coastal bacteria pollution. Gabrielli and his team at AgriLife Extension are well known for their innovative science and knowledge of how to optimize septic systems and to understand those interactions with watersheds. We started working and collaborating with Gabrielli and his team of researchers several years ago to help us gain insights into water quality trends, local and regional patterns, and to attempt to connect changes in water quality to many variables such as rainfall, beach visitation, and other unique metadata, such as even hotel occupancy tax. Today, his focus will be on Galveston Island, and plus he'll also give us some insights on other coastal counties. Today's presentation is part one of a special multi-part series where the second part will feature his colleague, Dr. Dr. Terry Gentry, and he'll share his results of microbial source tracking on Galveston Island. So let's buckle up, put on your thinking caps, and if you have readers, get those ready as well and get ready to learn. Without any further ado, let's welcome Dr. Bonatti. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, really honored to be part of this program both on the analysis of data and presenting. And uh, I'm really a little nervous considering so many people joining and uh, also for the good results that we are getting. And so I'm really thrilled to start this presentation. So I will start uh, sharing my screen so you can see my presentation. Well, we're excited to have you and we see your screen in presentation mode and can hear you well. Very good. So the title of the project is Integrative Assessment of Bacterial Pollution in Galveston Island. I specified task one, four, because there were five tasks and as Jason 
anticipated that we be uh, my colleague presenting another time for task five about the uh, track sourcing track sourcing. Um, thank you to the Middle Center, the GLO in general. And uh, I'm, my name is Gabriele Bonaiti, as Jason introduced me. Um, I will uh, go through the um, outline of my presentation. And uh, what I wanted to show you today is what we uh, produced for uh, as the last, uh, for the final report that are some infographic. So basically some slides that uh, put together the main uh, results. And uh, so I will have all the infographics showing there will be a lot of slides, but what I will do is just point in, in inside of each slide what I think is the main outcome. And so in case you download later, you can have time to go through other information if you want. Um, task one is about uh, bacteria trends. Task two is about the relationship to va variables like rainfall water level. Task three about relation with sewage potential contamination sources, and task four, uh, connection to uh, relation with visitations. I will, uh, at the end, I think you should already have a good idea of the last point, what areas maybe have more interest to uh, look in more details in the future. And then my last point will be a quick show of some analysis we are start doing in for the entire coastal zone, not just Galveston area. Uh, I will, uh, I need to thank, of course, Beachwatch, uh, Texas Beachwatch, because these are data we are using. This is a screenshot I took yesterday from their website, so you can have an idea where all the stations are located. And the one we are working uh, for this presentation is Galveston. I will later, with my final slide, uh, thank uh, also my colleagues. And, uh, and I, don't, I didn't list all the students that helped in this project and the statistics service on Texas A&M that helped us make sure we, did, we didn't do major mistakes in our work. So uh, this is, as you see, infographic are very busy slides. Uh, so if you are interested, you can go later, download and look at you know, more details. But what I wanna show you for this first slide is that we are we have been working on a data set starting in 2009 until 2022 uh, for about 36 sites. Actually, we'll uh, show you next slide that is zooming in the right side of the slide. So we have 36 sites. You can kind of see them along the beach, along the ocean. One only is on the bay side and all the others are on the ocean. They have numbers that are kind of complicated, both the beaches that group some sites and the individual sites that have long name like GL001 and so on. From now on, we only, most of the time, we just use the last number. So one to 33, the ones in the West End, there are three zones, 34 to 47 in the seawall zone, and then 48 to 55 in the East End of the area that we are looking at. So uh, diving in results and what we did, um, we had to do first a summary statistics uh, to have an idea of what we were dealing with. So here I'm just showing you uh, a chart on this side where I show you the statistic that we look at, at maximum, medium, ever, average, geo mean accidents. Geo mean and accidents are helping much more. And in fact, is what we have been using for the rest of the analysis mostly because they take care of, you know, these large peaks that you have some time compared to the most of the time low values. So the a distribution of data that is kind of is not normal. So you have problem troubles to understand what's going on. So the geo mean does less weight on the peaks. And so it gives you a better idea of what is the real average data. Accidents is a very important information because it's how many uh, reading go over the limit of one of four. So what, what we are showing is a percentage of exceeding this limit of one of four uh, uh, level. That is the one that if, if uh, passed, the beach must be closed. Uh, I wanna also show you uh, explain you, and I'm losing a little time on this chart because it's, I think it's one of the main outcome of the entire project. And it's showing that maximum and average values of the black and gray value go kind of together 
most of the time, whereas the other three median geomine exceedance that are the orange, uh, the dark orange and the blue, they go together again, but differently from maximum and medium. And so I'm pointing <laughs> out here where mostly are the differences, like with high value on the seawall, which is this area, station 34 through 55, 47. Another thing I wanted to show is what we did with this data is try to figure out what if there were any trend. So on the right side, you see monthly data for two example stations. And as you see, you have an idea of all the entire period of what's going on. Of course, we don't show daily data, it's too complicated. Then if you go to this link, you can see all station by station, all these results for the geomine and for the exceedance. The another thing I wanna show is a yearly trend when I put together all the stations just for a yearly value. And I see that there is a slight increase going from 2009 to 2021 with some high and down that are typical for all station, mostly in the seawall, but that are most everywhere. And maybe explained by the, a big drought in 2011, uh, a big uh, 2014, 15 uh, uh, algae bloom and uh, uh, in 2020, the COVID pandemic. Another thing that uh, kind of is highlighting is if you look at the uh, seasonal trend that we were able to do using a model called ARIMA, but it doesn't matter about that. I think the only thing I want to point is that it showed for almost all station, but again, mostly for the seawall that I'm showing here, peaks in around March, around June and July, the number here are the months, June and July and September, October. Now, if you want to look a little more, uh, again, still look at this data. So trend of this data, uh, enterococci, and especially geomine, we use another tool that is called emerging hotspot analysis that is, is able to show you if there is a consistent high uh, level of uh, geomine exceedance in the area. And it, it was able to point, point out this area that is the so-called seawall, and this area probably mostly because of this station in the bay side that is very high as typically in all the coast. Another way to represent this spatial value uh, trend is it was this one to show just year by year a map. And they're all very similar, but at the same time different. That's the other thing I wanna point out. If you look, if you have time to look station by station, this density map, it will show you that every year there is one station rather than another one popping up. And the final of this task one was uh, find out a, a, a statistic that was the easiest way to look at data. And so it was a ranking of the data. So what we did is rank in low, in three categories, categories low, medium, high for percentage of exceedance. Uh, all the uh, stations. So you can see 11% of the station are red. So you have four stations. And so they are high categories. So the percentage of exceedance is over 10% of the time. And then you have me, uh, yeah, in yellow, the medium uh, exceedance and in green, the uh, low. Going to task two, we wanted to, we wanted to look at environmental data. So rainfall and uh, uh, sea uh, level. That was the suggestion from GLO since the beginning. Here, I just want you to show you what we were looking at. So uh, rainfall from the airport station and the sea level from four, sta for, uh, four stations. One is, um, yeah, it's showing down there. So first of all, we wanted to look at how they look like this data. So in this big slides, all I wanted to point out is we have a typical trend every year with a little differences with higher rainfall in, this, in September and toward the end of the year. And for the water levels, uh, we just compared this. You see this on the right side is our study period. And we see that they are consistent with the overall trend since the beginning of the century. So it's keeping going up. Also, there is a little uh, trend seasonally again with sea level that it tend to go higher in the spring and in the fall. Another thing is uh, task two now is to compare 
the, this rainfall and water level to our bacteria. So we were not sure how to do that. So in, in general, the entire study here was to figure out how to compare things, to pull out something meaningful. So uh, first of all, I think it was very useful to just look at the data day by day. And this is an example and that and doing this and in purple, you see the enterococci and the others are this environmental. We found out that there is maybe some other variable like the dotted red line that is the uh, temperature, see what temperature in 2014 went very high. This is really the highest ever temperature registered. And it goes with the year with the highest readings and maybe also correlated exactly in the same time. Anyway, uh, trying to correlate the rainfall and water level to bacteria, we found a slightly positive correlation for all st most of stations, I would say all of them, uh, which suggests that there is a uh, driving from rainfall at sea level. Of course, the uh, significance was always kind of low, but there was still a correlation that we wanted to point out. Going to task three, uh, task three was uh, focusing on uh, potential source of contamination, and specifically the septic systems, OSSF, uh, we call in, it, in, uh, in Texas, on-site sewage facilities, and on your right, the uh, wastewater treatment plants. So in terms of OSSF septic system, we see that most of them mapping through, thank you to another project that we carry out in the coastal zone, they're mostly on the west end. Uh, and the, in the regarding the wastewater treatment plant, they are all uh, draining. Uh, the, the outlets are all in the bay side. Then we also looked though at many other information like stormwater outfall, outfall, uh, septic uh, the sewage um, problems. And in doing that, we also made a map of the entire island in terms of uh, micro basins and direction of flow. If you see the darker blue is where the water tends to go. So most of the water goes toward the bay side in terms of surface drainage. Trying to correlate the sources to the bacteria, uh, we look at the flow violations for uh, for the wastewater treatment plant. And we see that uh, most of the flow violation happen here in the seawall area. And in terms of E. coli violations are mostly again in this area and station 21. If you wanna make uh, a statistical com 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 comparison uh, to bacteria to this source of uh, uh, potential contamination and, and say a final word, I would say that based on our analysis, there is little evidence that OSSF are correlated based on our analysis, our data available that were limited with the uh, uh, high levels that we observed in this data set. Again, the same uh, in terms of flow violations, there was difficult to identify uh, uh, evidence of correlation. And we found some correlation with the E. coli uh, and specifically one point was the one that was carrying up the entire correlation because with the highest level was correlated to the highest uh, violation of E. coli. Going to task four, uh, we had, were asked to compare also the attendance, the uh, visits of, uh, of, the, uh, of the beaches. What we came out with was to compare uh, data from well, you see on your right, four type of estimate for us. Uh, the data coming from the Big Watch, that, that, that data started in 2019 and they were registering how many people they saw when they were going out. And they were doing that mostly at eight o'clock in the morning and the first part of the week. So this is kind of the type of information we got. Then we also went down a few times during the project period to just observe personally what was going on and interview people. And what we noticed is that there was kind of a high uh, level of visit, uh, visiting of attendance in the middle part of the day. And this chart maybe is kind of complicated, but what it shows is all the station visited in the morning, then in the middle of the day and the evening. And so you see all the station going uh, in blue and in orange, the, the, the dogs. 
that we uh, we, we could see. So the trend was similar in all part of the day of part of the uh, day, but in the evening some stations were very busy compared to others, and uh, the seawall was the one that most of the time was the busiest. Also, the interview uh, gave very interesting information about period of year. Uh, and so on, that were correlated most of the time with our observations. And finally, indirect estimates, uh, we look at hotel occupancy tasks, uh, tax and uh, parking information. I will give you more information about this in the next slides. In particular, the uh, occupancy tax, uh, we wanted to, it was very difficult to uh, uh, use as uh, the, the format of the data was difficult. So what we use was mostly yearly and in some cases monthly, in some cases monthly, like when you see this left part of the slides, this is a uh, June, 2022, where we were able to locate each uh, hotel and uh, uh, independent structure and, uh, uh, and the number and the, and the value of the tax and then converted that on a hexagon uh, pictures like this trying to summarize all the data showing where darker brown most of the tax was coming from. We also look at the parking, but the parking had much more limits, but all we can say that it was quite consistent with what we observed in the hotel in terms of yearly and uh, uh, overall data. So in the chart below, you see that the uh, I'm showing both parking and hotel occupancy monthly data. And they have a similar trend. Again, similar also to the other observation we said before with peaks on March, uh, June, July, and September, October. Finally, uh, trying to correlate uh, correlate this occupancy, this occupancy tax uh, data with the entrocochi. Uh, and now I'm, I'm already telling you these next three slides are, will, will be kind of uh, complicated. So I, I bet I might lose you, but I'll try to, uh, to help uh, you understand what I, we did. Um, but basically we were first looking how this occupancy tax behaved and so see if there was some clustering and so on. Uh, and then compare that with the bacteria. We couldn't do any space-time analysis because there was not enough data. I'm zooming in in this part of the slide and show you that we did some hotspot, cluster, and outlier analysis. Hotspot and cluster are just similar analysis, but give you, they have a little different meaning. Outlier is an, another information. So hotspot and cluster show you if there is something that is consistently high in an area. So if uh, sites are consistently high in that area. And so you can see on top here, you have some consistently high, uh, this red, dark, and the bottom, you will see the light red that shows the same information, similar, uh, and this is consistent with the hotspot. So hotspot and cluster are kind of similar. Outliers are shown with the in the bottom image with a dark red and dark blue, and we see that we find some of them. Outliers are when you find a high value in an uh, area where mostly the values are low and vice versa, if you find a low value and that would be the red in an area where it's mostly high. So this helped us to do the final step. So to compare this occupancy tax to the enterocochi. So we did that month by month, station by station. This chart is showing you, and this is the only one I would like you to focus the attention in this slide. It's showing you that we found a correlation. So you see on the left is the correlation value, the candles coefficient. When it's over 0.2 is a moderate strength. So all these points are interesting and all the other maybe are low, but still are positive. And they show that there is a correlation, uh, especially station 22 uh, and here along the seawall and here on the right side, on the and uh, of the, uh, on the east side of uh, the island. And then the final step, if you are still with me, is this step where we compare the map that I showed you before, where we uh, showed the density of the hotel occupancy converted to a hexagons, because we have too many points, to the type, similar type of representation from the enterocochi. So for enterocochi, we have the entire year data, 
and from 2015 to 2021. For the title composite tax, we only have June 22 because it was the only one we had time to process all the data. But we thought that was still meaningful to compare the two. And so we did an analysis. Uh, sorry, I'm going back because uh, I'm telling you uh, how it's called. It's, it's called uh, geographic weighted regression. It's a special type of tool that shows a spatial regression. And basically what it does, it overlaps these two images and starts to find out if there is a consistency between the two images. And the output is this image on the bottom where it shows you what is called a standardized residuals. Basically, if the standardized residual is less than 2.5, either positive or negative number, that means that you have a confidence more than 95% that there is a correlation between the two images. So as you see for all the hexagons in this image, we have all values that are below that threshold. So we have overall a very good consistency between the two images. And with this, I'm, I'm done with uh, reporting, um, reporting this project in the Galveston. And I wanna just spend a few minutes left uh, to show what we are doing for the entire coastal zone. We are gonna focus on New Essex County for a, a very similar analysis, but we also did a very quick uh, uh, ranking. If you remember the ranking uh, was uh, converted to three categories of exceedance, percentage of exceedance, high, medium, or low. And we did that for the entire coastal zone that using the data that the Texas Beach Watch provided. And so I'm showing you uh, what the, the result of it, uh, starting from the south uh, of Texas coastal zone. So Cameron County, mostly green, uh, New Essex, Clever, Clever, uh, uh, Aransas County, mostly red in the uh, bay side, mostly green and yellow on the coast, in the ocean side. Matacorda and Brazoria counties, mostly red. And uh, Galveston and the Jefferson and Harris County, as you see in the left bottom is what we have been discussing for the entire presentation. But now there we have also the other points. Again, all the bay side is red and all the ocean is kind of ten tendency green with some yellow in uh, Bolivar Peninsula. And finally, <clears throat> uh, all this, coastal zone, I, I represent in this chart is the same chart that I showed you for the Galveston area, just select, uh, uh, selecting the maximum and the exceedance values. So what I'm showing here is all the station from Cameron County on the left, all the way to Jefferson. So the end of the coast, so you kind of have an image of the spatial trend. And uh, on the left, the percentage of exceedance, which is the blue line, and on the right, the maximum values that is, are the black line. Again, high value if you go, you are in the high category if you go over 10% of the exceedance. So what we notice here is that all, until you get to New Oasis, and especially when you go the station 25, 26 is when you're going in the bay side, uh, you don't get in the high, but then you start getting the high and especially New Oasis County, Mata Gorda, and a little less Brazoria, and again, some high spot in uh, Harris County. Harris County, we have only three stations, and again, low in Jefferson County. So this is a, a summary of all the way we thought to represent uh, our data to try to pull out some meaningful information. And uh, I think with this, I am, uh, I'm done with my presentation and I'm open to questions that you might have. And here, sorry, I also list my coll main collaborators, Anish Chantrani and Terry Gentry. Terry Gentry will be presenting next time, but I'm not listing, listing all the students and the statistic support in campus. There was too long list. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Panati. That was an incredible presentation uh, I, that I think uh, I'm still digesting quite a bit of that information, even though I've, I've been seeing this information for a while and learned a lot from you right here. Just as a quick reminder to our participants that if you have questions or comments, please place those into the chat box and we'll be addressing those each here in the next few moments. So uh, 
Dr. Benanti, the uh, I, I thought your your work with the data was remarkable, and um, I was wondering just kind of open the open up and break the ice with a question here. Uh, often we we want to assess and bring in as much information as possible, but I'm I'm curious about was there a a data set or information that you wanted to gain access to that would have been helpful in the analysis. Uh, perhaps there were just glimpses of that data, but not a big enough data set to actually include with this level of analysis you're conducting here. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question, <laughs> if I may say the truth, but maybe I start answering, maybe then you can if correct me. Uh, for sure, I think there are a lot of drivers that are missing here if you're, if you're talking about drivers and uh, what, the first one that was really amazing to see was the uh, ocean temperature or uh, the algae blooms that you know came out when we were trying to explain why we were seeing this or that. Also, if you remember, we in our conversation tried to understand what we were seeing. And suddenly we were coming across very important information that we didn't even think about at the beginning. So. For sure, there is a lot of things hidden. Uh, again, we are expert in wastewater, septic systems, a little less in all these other type of uh, drivers that uh, you know can explain problems in the ocean. So uh, I think it would be nice to, to discuss this with as many people as possible and people that can, while seeing this result, can come out with suggestions on what data sets we should look at and that would be great you know or even now that we are working on uss county uh, we are just at the beginning we have an year in front of us and maybe we can shift a little bit to also other and i think another important thing is the uh, tax occupancy or those type of information that were provided very nicely kindly from the city and the park but for our analysis we need to do a lot of work in converting them in some format that is useful. And so that is a time uh, consuming work. And so, yeah, that type of data set would be very useful to have them in better format. Yeah, yeah thank you. I, you hit the nail right on the head. That, that was uh, what I was trying to ask. Uh, so thank you so much for that. I'd like to turn it over to Christina to see if we have some questions in chat and uh, to address those. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Jason. All right, we do have a question. Um, which variable had the most influence on bacteria? Could you speak to unpacking determining influences? Uh, that's a, a very uh, difficult question to answer, but I mean, all I say, it will be based on what I've seen in this project. And so uh, for sure, we saw almost all the variables that we look at that were contributing some to uh, to the bacteria, um, for sure the the human factor it looks like very important. We don't understand how, why, uh, but that is very, for sure is very important. But I think the main uh, result of this is understanding that it's really a combination, an incredible combination that is hard to understand, and uh, that is worth to investigate more. To understand the dynamics because that's the result the impact is very important because we end up closing a beach and so to prevent that it, it requires a lot of work it would be very nice to go in depth uh, of course every researcher will say that but i think the interaction between all these variables and other is the key factor in this type of study Great, thank you. And the next question, maybe this is a little bit more specific. Um, is the influence or correlation of water temperature true for all sites you sampled? Uh, uh, we didn't expect to, to work with that. So we noticed that uh, influence just late. And so uh, I don't, I couldn't do that analysis. And so I cannot answer this question. For sure, uh, I showed that for one station. I think I didn't mention that the, the chart I was showing was for station 34. That is one of the, the station in the west part of the seawall that most had most of the high uh, values. And uh, 
it looks like there's a correlation. We didn't even try to, to do a correlation. All we did it was a visually looking at the trend as you saw that all I did was that chart that you that I shared with you. So, but I saw that it was exactly in the summer, exactly in the year, and the highest temperature was in corresponding with the highest values we observed. You know, not exactly the same. Well, the temperature is not a, just a day, it's just a, a period. So it looks a strong correlation there, uh, but I, I couldn't go station by station, of course, uh, to, to check that. And the next so, Sorry, sorry, I want to add this. 2014, uh, in the one of the first charts I showed was the year or the second year with the highest value for the entire data set combining the entire thing. So it looks like there is a correlation with all stations, yes. Thank you. All right, the next question is, does stagnant water have a large factor or does stagnant water play a role? Uh, I wonder if a uh, role in the uh, Bacteria reading or the correlation? I think this probably is more a question for Jason. Jason, do you want to answer this question? Well, I, what I can do is I can reference observations from the data in our long-term trend study uh, that we published uh, with HRI, and it's uh, it's actually on our Clean Coast Texas website in the resources section. I think we can put a link to that. That study did identify uh, significant differences between Bayside water quality concentrations for Enterococcus and Gulf side. And so we did, we did see significant differences in those data sets that, um, that did indicate that uh, obviously with the, our Gulf of Mexico here in Texas, it's a high energy environment, high dilution factor, uh, nearly limitless volume uh, compared to our Bayside, which is typically going to be a lower energy environment pending wind conditions and less dilution. So we, we do see uh, those two different environments demonstrating different concentrations of bacteria. Thank you, Jason. Um, the next question might be for both of y'all as well. So this is Difficult to understand. There's a lot of different variables and it can be hard to pinpoint one thing or another. Um, so what might be the public's role to help with this? Oh, well, I think this is really for Jason. I mean, I have my idea about Jason. Yes, I think Jason, you would answer better. Well, each of us has a role. Uh, each community has a role, each cog, each planning group, each developer, um, how we uh, tread in our local communities, it all does make a difference cumulatively. So uh, we can share our information about wanting good water quality with our friends and peers and family. We can pick up after our pets. Uh, we can practice some of the best techniques for our yards and uh, take care of our vehicles and then communicate with decision makers about the need to address uh, stormwater quality, non-point source pollution. So it's, uh, it's, it's not necessarily one particular solution, but it's communicating to the folks in, uh, who do make decisions on behalf of the community. Right. Um, we have another one in the chat. Also, if you are anxiously waiting to put a question in, feel free to do that now. Okay, this next one is about Galveston Island State Park and their data around attendance estimates. Do you think that these data might be available? And if so, how might they inform this type of study? Uh, yeah, uh, the park uh, shared, shared some if some information is the one that uh, we used, but uh, I'm sure it could be much more useful if we can collaborate in uh, in formatting that more for in a way that can help our analysis. And, and based on what we saw, maybe now we have more ideas than when we start discussing that together. And when we were asking for the data, now probably we have more idea what could be useful. But yeah, it's key information. I think it's really inf in useful information. So it would be nice to uh, use more of that, as I mentioned also before. 
Thank you. That's all the questions and comments in the chat for now. If I could uh, make one comment regarding the driver's question a few minutes ago, and the simple answer is we we do not know, but we're starting to see some commonality in patterns amongst different data sets. For instance, in the long-term trend study referenced a minute ago, uh, that study did reveal uh, peaks or higher enterococci concentrations, March, June, July, and September. That coincided with Dr. Panati's findings here specific to Galveston Island with the finer scope, finer tune of the analysis. We, we have been in, venturing into this to try to characterize uh, beach water quality and to understand it better. We've done the type of analysis here, coupled it with source tracking. We've also conducted modeling and we have a, a new project that we'll be launching later this year, which will be joining a modeling team with a environmental monitoring team. So we can join those data sets to work collaboratively together uh, with the team led by Dr. Hanadi Rafai out of U of H. So we should have some more insights on this in the next couple of years as we continue to refine our techniques and tactics. Thanks for that extra tidbit. We have one more question come in. Um, and this question asks, is there any ongoing E. coli monitoring in North Galveston Bay? I think, uh, again, Jason, probably you are more aware, beside the, uh, the wastewater treatment plants monitoring. If, if the question is specific to surface water, uh, there there may be uh, some monitoring being conducted through the Galveston Bay and Estuary Program or Galveston Bay Foundation specific to E. coli, uh, but I'm, I'm uncertain on that uh, right now. That's it from the chat for now. Well, Dr. Bonatti, thank you so much for choosing to spend some of your time with us today. Really did appreciate your presentation. I look forward to your colleague, Dr. Gentry's, uh, Gentry's presentation later in August. And I'm also excited about your team and their work as we uh, are turning our focus over to Nueces County and beginning to uh, share similar techniques and also refine the process there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Christina. Thank you so much for having me today. It was really nice, interesting. I'm looking forward to work more on this. Thank you to the audience and participants choosing to spend some time with us today as well. I hope you got some bite-sized morsels to better understand coastal water quality. Also, thanks and acknowledgement to Christina Lopez and Sarah Wingfield for co-hosting and technical expertise, as well as making Clean Coast Texans operate smooth as can be. And we will be with you again April 25th with Lucy Flores featuring Texas Beach Watch program. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you all then. Have a great day. Take care.